now what do we do? <laughs> Does somebody want to? Do you all write? <laughs> it looks as though you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I have a question that I've had read your stuff that's very pleasant for many years going back to your incredible days as a film critic, which I just picked a look at the best films that I've read. How do you feel about the, the New Yorker now? I mean, have, I mean recently we read Gone, and you know, going back, and now it's like 13, 12 or 13 years since, since the uh, New Yorker's changed. Do you still have a similar view of, the, uh, of its progress or devolution? Or? Well, here's what happened. I mean, there have been so much. Um, that was, from my point of view, unfortunate that happened before I wrote Gone. I mean, which actually caused me to write Gone, because otherwise, well, so I wrote Gone, and then it, then it, it got worse. I mean, the unfortunate times. So the intervening years, I would have to say, I haven't really read The New Yorker. <laughs> that is some. Um, so I can't really answer your question, but I guess, I guess all I said at the time, although it turned out you're not allowed to say this either, was that it would never be the same again. It's true, I started out by saying the New Yorker's dead, but I made it pretty clear which New Yorker I meant. And it didn't have to do with Condé Nast having bought it, and it didn't have to do with Tina Brown. It just had to do with a lot of other things, but then it turned into such a, an unpleasant discussion from where I was. Um, that I just thought, I, I don't really think I'm going to read any, anymore just now, so I didn't. And that just now lasted years. So if there's something, I read it. I mean, you know, there are good things and I read them, but not all of them, but I don't read good things and everything, anything else either. So it's okay. It's just not the New Yorker I knew. And I guess the summing up of it was that, that there were, through all the years, several cabals about the succession. And I belong to a cabal. I still have friends there. I belong to a cabal. And my cabal lost. I mean, it understates it to say my cabal lost. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that Steamboat, the uh, form, came out almost accidentally. And I think you mentioned this in the interview as well. Did Pitch Dark, was that more planned, the way of uh, like the fragments and the yeah. form of the novel? Although planned is a funny word for it. What happened is I started with the first chapter as a short story. And I wanted it under a pseudonym. And over the years, I've wanted many times to do things under a pseudonym. And Mr. Sean, who was the sort of one of the two immortals the editors of The New Yorker, said, no, no, a pseudonym is no good. It won't do you any good. It'll wear out. But on this, in this one case, he said, we can do it under a pseudonym. We can do it any way you want. We'll do it. And then with one thing and another, it turned out he couldn't really do it. So I then, actually Vanity Fair did it, was in the beginning, but under a pseudonym. But I went to my then editor at Knopf, and I said, what if I publish this as a novel under a pseudonym? And he said, first of all, if you want everybody to say, here's a piece of fiction by Renata Adler under the pseudonym, then we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, what makes you think it's a novel? So I then wrote the two other chapters. It's not correct to say I then wrote the other two chapters. Do you find that you're writing all the time in a way, and you'll either use it or you won't use it, or you think you should be writing and you're not writing, but, but there's stuff and you'll either continue with it or you won't. And then maybe you will when you weren't going to. And that's pretty much what happened here. Just the Irish chapter, the first draft of it went very fast, because I wrote it by hand. I never write by hand, because I have a tremor. But I wrote it by hand very fast, exactly as I thought it would have happened. And then I thought, hey, wait a minute. This isn't what I do. And then I changed it somewhat. I mean, I didn't change what happened, but I changed. I mean, it wasn't five pages anymore. So yeah. Are you still writing fiction? Yeah, I think I, I think I just finished a novel, but you know, then, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> it isn't really a novel until you turn it in. I mean, that's the, that's the block. It's not the writer's block. It's the turning in block. That's not a title. No, it's funny you should ask that. But I never did have titles. I mean, they. Always, I mean, Speedboat got its title because there's. There's one paragraph in it in which somebody's bought a very 
It's 50 new speedboat. And people are going out for a ride in it. And they're different nationalities, but there's an American woman and she's very enthusiastic. So the boat scuds along and there are the bounces and she's so enthusiastic she bounces over every wave and then she breaks her back. I mean, actually that happened. But I thought, what, what's the excuse for having this paragraph in there? And then I thought, well, it's not a speedboat. <laughs> it really happened that way, actually. <laughs> well, what else? Have I been up here for hours? I don't know. No, no. It's put up here 30, 30 minutes. Right, well, then I should do something. <laughs> Well, here's something else. I mean, I care in a different way and in a different part of myself about nonfiction. And it had come to me before, and I guess I've mentioned it before, but it's this. It's that all, you know, Frank Conroy, who's a wonderful writer, I don't know if you know his work at all, but Frank Conroy was an old friend of mine. We were at college together. And he wrote his autobiography to the age of 18. It was called Stop Time, and it's a masterpiece. And it took a long time to get people to publish it. And then it became sort of an acknowledged masterpiece. But he, Frank used to say that the way he worked is he would sit down at the typewriter, and it was as though the ages or the history of literature was flowing through his fingers, were speaking through him, through his fingers. I sort of envisioned it as the harpsichord, you know, maybe harpsichord or something like that. I must say it's never been that for me at all. But for me, it has always been, and I think maybe for everybody to a certain extent, is you write to address the situation. And whether the situation is that you're lonely or that you want to communicate with somebody or that you just want to, as you might sing or dance on your own, you just need to do something, or you're unhappy, or you're happy, or you feel you want to say something. That's, I think, nonfiction, what you're addressing is an external situation, a public situation. That is, maybe you're reporting, it's got to be factually true, as true as you can make it, you want to tell a story that is true, and that is the test. Oh, also the importance of the story may be part of the test, or the interest of the story or something about the story, but all the measures are external. And in an essay, that too is the exterior world. You're trying not to say to people, this is so, but you're trying to persuade people of something. And maybe in a review, it's a different thing you're trying to do, but it's still addressed. It's, it, the addressee is exterior, exterior. And in fiction, I think the addressee is most likely interior, or the situation that you're addressing is interior. I mean, there's no compulsion in the outside world to write a novel or tell a tale. <coughs> but that was not something that hadn't occurred to me until recently, so I haven't really thought it through, but I think it's true. <coughs> Although there may be people who write fiction because I think other people should know this. <laughs> I mean, um, well, go ahead, you want to say something? Yeah, well, when you were talking earlier, when you first um, started reading the speedboat and you, and you were making distinctions and saying this is true and this is not true, so are you suggesting, though it's called a novel, that the materiality of the book is sort of flickering between fiction and nonfiction? Yeah, that's probably so. But I think the minute you say this is fiction, and in the old days it was, maybe they still do it sometimes, but they used to do it on radio programs, they used to do it in books, all resemblance to the character living or dead is purely coincidental. And that's, that's absurd. <laughs> it's always absurd. But I do think that the minute you say this is fiction, you brought a completely different set of values into play, no matter how true it is. So you, they've got to sort of trust you that it's to be read as fiction, even if every word is literally true. And I did find that some of the most absurd parts of things were true, and I had to stop. I mean, I noticed some people pointed out that um, there's this paragraph about a coffin with a corpse in it falling out of a plane. Uh, you know, and the lady down below is working in her garden. I may have made up, no, I didn't make up the lady working in her garden, but certainly a, a 
coffin with a corpse fell out of it, you know, into somebody's garden, into somebody's yard. So that sounds like something you might make up if you were an absurdist. But it was so, so I couldn't go on with it much longer. And there are several <laughs> things like that. Because <laughs> otherwise people would say, this time you know, you're going too far. Yeah. Um, one are there writers that you feel a particular affinity with, or do you think, do you ever think of yourself as part of a school or part of a movement of writers? Never as part of the school or part of the movement, but certainly there are writers I feel affinity with, and at different times, different writers, so that sometimes they can, I mean, quite often they're writers as unlike me as they could possibly be. And, and then there are writers for whom I feel incredible admiration, but no affinity, that I would have thought is, would have thought were part, I mean, not Walker. Who could not acknowledge this, the, the, the virtuosity of this man, and also the, the kind of modernism. I mean, there's a story that begins, and in the second place, because, I mentioned it in some story, well, who begins a story and in the second place because when there's been no first place and there's been nothing to say because about it, it just, it's just so brilliant in the scheme up to the degree to which these are modern. It's just, oops, it's just, it's just brilliant. But I don't feel On the other hand, it took me a very long time. I don't know if you've read 100 Years of Solitude. But I had um, Donald Rothman at one point came to visit me late at night. I'm not a person who visited late at night. He said, you, <laughs> you think, you think um, 100 Years of Solitude is a better book than I will ever write? And I said, no, honestly, I don't. In fact, I haven't even read it. <laughs> and he said, don't tell me that. I, you have, and you just, anyway, then he left. <laughs> <laughs> then I went to Cuba. I just, I was working for the Times, and it was movie reviews, and the Times wasn't allowed into Cuba for various reasons, it was banned, but the movie review was allowed in, just for spite, I think. <laughs> anyway, somebody said, and I was only allowed to watch movies, nothing else, um, and somebody said to me, you know, we are at a point in our revolution when we have to decide whether we're going to go the way of 100 years of solitude or something else. And I thought, gee, you know, this is two very different <laughs> sources telling me I must read 100 years of <laughs> So I tried, and I failed after 50 pages, and another time I failed after 150 pages, and then 100 pages. And I thought, what is, you know, I really tried, and I couldn't. And then, one time, I was in the right mood, and it just strikes me as the masterpiece of our age. I don't think he ever wrote another one. I don't nothing else he wrote, writes particularly interests me, although that may change, but I wonder if you've, if, if you've ever just had a sort of skiing experience through 100 years of solitude, and there, of course, there's no, there's no plot, there's nothing, there's just how long can this incredible invention go on, and it just keeps coming, it just keeps coming. Yeah? When you were writing Spirit Bound, did you write it in the order in which it appears? Because it is a novel, but it's almost like a collage put together. Yeah, I don't know how people do collages because the visual arts are not. But, but what happened is it, it wasn't a collage because sequence. I mean, there isn't sequence in in the visual arts, I guess, except cinema. But I did change the order. But then I found when when editing was going on in New York, parts of it. I'm suddenly pieces that parts that have been rejected or accepted and never published or whatever suddenly found their way in. I suddenly realized not anything can go anywhere. And then it became very, I mean, suddenly I would feel impelled to move something from here to there. And it was very important to me, no matter how late in the editing process it was. So I moved things, but then they were meant to stay there. And I haven't, in looking back, because you have to look back to proofread, I haven't suddenly thought, no, no, this doesn't go here, this goes here. So that's, you know, it's a question for me. I, I was thinking, you know, if you, if you throw a deck of cards on the floor, you have sort of 52 to pick up. But if you throw the pieces of a puzzle on the floor, you know, either the pieces belong or they don't belong. Of course, it's very clear when you do, because there's a picture. So it's not as clear with this sort of fragments. But I would hope that as I learn to write, I guess, Pieces are more like the pieces of a puzzle. 
than like your regards. Yeah. 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 I have another question. Um, um, I I really admire the first the first two novels, and then I and then I haven't heard from a, a, you know, and I wondered why whether you continued to write or whether you stopped writing. I did both. I continued to write and I stopped writing. <laughs> and I, it was mostly, it was, I guess this can have more than once in life, but for me those were in part years in the wilderness. I thought, okay, I mean there was a point when I started to, I mean it's not unrelated to my relations with the New Yorker and the New York Times and with <clears throat> journalists generally of my time, that I thought, okay, I have been luckier in my professional life than I ever hoped to be. And so I'm just going to say this stuff all the people really, I mean, professionally, it's, it's not a good idea. So <laughs> what happened is I went to, and I thought, you know, so what's the risk? I mean, it's been good enough. I don't, I don't need, I'm a book, this is cool. And, and then I went out into the wilderness. I mean, it was like being, yeah, I went out into the wilderness, and I, it was a kind of, well, Michael Wolf described it, I mean, I really bought it, it was a kind of, he didn't call it that, but it was a kind of blacklisting, it was really, and so it reminded me sort of the worst parts of school, and I thought, all right, so I'll stop for, I'll just stop, maybe I'll stop for good. And then it turned out I didn't really want to do that. I didn't really want to stop completely, and then of course, these reprints came along, and that changed everything in a way because these books were out of print, it changes things whether you're in print or not. More than I would have guessed. Is that too much of an answer or no answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have one more um, comment, if my memory serves me correctly. But I think you did a piece in the Atlantic Monthly. Yes. Uh, Richard Nixon? Yes. Which I, which was, mid, was it mid 70s? Yeah, after he resigned. Yes. And what was interesting about that piece was I was very actively involved in research at that point. I, I'm a lawyer, but I write also, but you know, posted more stuff on it. My writing has nothing, really nothing to do with the political stuff, but I'm extremely interested in it. And I think in that piece, you made the allegation which no one really pursued before that one of the reasons that Nixon had so quickly resigned was that I think General Hay had information on him that he was taking dr drug money from South Korean politicians. And I think nobody pursued that. It's just typical, of Amer to me, of American journalism. who will go only so far. You know, it, it always struck me that Nixon was pushed out of office on the flimsiest kind of, you know, things like, things like you know, the cover-up. And, and there was a whole, whole a number of, 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 of whole areas of, of his uh, administration no one really wanted to look into because that's something that was, it was just an easy way to get rid of it. So he had so many enemies. But it was an interesting allegation and very and, and fascinating, and I just was totally fascinated by it. Because of all the, you know, it, it sort of scratched the surface of who Nixon really was in his private life. And there were other, other pieces written by more radical journalists, you know, in, uh, in, in anti-CIA magazines and the like, you know, that ties with the mafia. But, the, but what was fascinating about that was the discreet sort of comment that there were, you know, that sort of hate had the goods on it. Oh, although I didn't mean to say that so much because Hay was very much a villain of the piece. I, but the, I mean, you know, these things get dim in my memory as well. But I think that piece, I really, I really did pursue something. And I, first of all, I thought, what must be the truth? What would really be ghastly? I mean, you can only impeach a president for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And at the impeachment inquiry, where I was working sort of secretly on the staff, everybody was focused on what other high crimes and misdemeanors means. And it's, it was very clear, I mean, if, I mean, somebody called in and said that, that the president was shot at him. You couldn't really, I mean, that's not, what they mean is crimes, and it, well, it, it's a term of art, other high crimes and misdemeanors, but politically, the inquiry had to go the way it went. But then I thought, what must he have done? Just dreaming a little. And I thought, well, supposing it's some version of treason and bribery. And of course, they wouldn't technically be treason anyway, but it, there, suddenly there was a huge amount of evidence that the committee to re-elect the president in Southeast Asia funneled the money into the Watergate, and that was the reason to cover it up. Who cared? Everybody was breaking into every place. It made no difference why they broke in. Woodward and Bernstein, I much admire Bernstein. It was, 
it was valuable in keeping the story of the burglary alive, but it wasn't really, I mean, it had no contribution to the history of historical thinking at all, except in terms of the decline of the press with the invention of the story. But all that is controversial. Controversial, I mean, people disagree. Um, but okay, so I, I looked, and it turned out, I mean, it's been coming out lately, too, when the real stuff is coming out of the Kennedy Library, the Chenault, so none of this will mean anything to you, but the, the Anna Chenault and her husband and so forth, and the Southeast Asian connection, but it, there suddenly began to be real, there is a moment when Kissinger, in the negotiations with Hanoi, says, peace is at hand. And Kissinger wouldn't say peace is at hand, unless he thought peace is at hand. And I think Haig went over and double-crossed him because the South Vietnamese did not want peace to be at hand just yet. It was very valuable. And so if that was true, if they were bribing the president, in effect, to continue the war, and the American boys were dying for this, that's close enough to bribery, certainly, and even maybe close enough to treason. And it was, I mean, I just thought dreaming a little, but it turned out there was so much evidence for this. So then the peace came out. And then Abe Rosenthal called in one of those investigative reporters and he said, there's 16 facts in this piece. How come we don't have them? And the investigative reporter question said, oh, we knew that. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> but I think it's true. And then, and then it was all this really exotic stuff. I, in fact, I'm thinking of, of reprinting that piece because there's been a lot of Chenault stuff coming out. When it, it, it's complicated. It's a very complicated story. He repeatedly outsized, but as a Ken Kennedy scholar and a, you know, and a sort of drug scholar, a scholar basically of the whole the China connection, there's not a huge amount of research in, you know, in Berkeley on that. There has? Yeah, oh yeah, he was a fantastic writer about the whole nation of the war, with the, the connection between war and, and drugs also. And, oh, see, I but then Nixon on the other hand has turned out to be, you know, comparable, I mean, as bad as his record was in the he's turned out to be liberal from Andrew Clinton and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, and Obama on some issues like EPA and any other things. He's, you know, he's, he was to the left of them because the, because the center has moved so far to the right. It's so funny. And, he, and Obama's prosecuting whistleblowers. Where it's terrible. And, and sending thing. drones to kill people. I mean, who expected that? So it's, it's a very different point of view. But even the whole question of left and right has become so crazed. I mean, it just, I mean, it's just, uh, I used to, when I, when, when I was young, I registered as a Republican just out of mischief because there were <laughs> journalists in New York that I knew of. And it got me voting in some interesting primaries. <laughs> and then suddenly this party just went off the right in ways I could never have imagined. I mean, nobody could have imagined. It's not even the right. It's just off a cliff of, of I don't know what. I don't know what. But I guess the country has weathered over time so many extremes. And so many really dangerous nuts of various persuasions that one just has to say, well, we hope. You know, this one is overwhelmed by the variety of it. But the other side doesn't look so good, does it? I mean, I like Clinton, and I liked. Who else did I like? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nixon, after all, the opening to China. That's a very significant achievement. And I don't know anybody who's come near it since. And then Lyndon Johnson, one couldn't help liking Lyndon Johnson in the end because of what he did in the South and what he did. I mean, I guess Johnson and Nixon look way better than one ever dreamed they would look. And Clinton looks pretty good to me, too. It's just the others look so bad. But I mean, that's not my field, is it? <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's all of our field, but it's not. It's just a mess. I think we have time for two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just curious about the story of the reprints and, and how it feels to revisit these novels and be doing press again and reading again. What was the first part? This, how, did the, how did, I want to hear the story about the novels going back into print and then how it feels to be promoting them again. <coughs> well, it's funny because the first time, there were, I wasn't promoting I mean, it didn't, it didn't happen that way. But this time, of course, the book review, this classic has been heroic here. But no, and, not but, and. What happened in 2010 is some critic circle that voted what book they would most like to see in print, back in print, and it was Speedboat. 
but who cares? It's pretty exclusive. <laughs> and then Melville House came to me and said, look, we'll reprint all your books. And I said, great. Because the guy who ran it, I mean, it's a long story, I, I liked them a lot. And then something began to happen. It just wasn't, nothing was happening. I mean, this, well, I don't know how it evaporated somehow. And in that time, New York Review Classics came and, and said, what about Speedboat? And I told my agent, we can't do that. It's already at Melville House. And then nothing was happening. And then, thank goodness, it was New York Review. I mean, I'm very fond of Melville House. It's, it just, I couldn't stay there. And then got really sort of cross. But I just was very lucky that they came back. How it feels, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they're back. I didn't realize that I sort of minded not having anything in print. <laughs> I seem to go out of print faster than. Yeah. I wanted to ask um, when you mentioned before when you went off to the Wilderness, how long did you not write and publish for? How long was the gap? Well, I guess I wrote a couple of academic pieces and then a couple of key political pieces. But I was never a prolific writer. I mean, with all whatever I've written, if I ran a boarding house and I had 12 children and I had a full time job beside it, would be sort of, isn't it interesting? She also writes. I mean, there is isn't <laughs> there. There is enough there. But in this time, I wrote maybe four or five pieces, and that must be. 14 years, 12 years, 12 years. Because I wrote one that I was rather pleased with, it was nonfiction. And it began to have the same fate as other things I'd written. Somebody would get it and say, yeah, this is really wonderful, we're gonna publish it tomorrow. And then it would just vanish. So I thought, no, not, not this anymore, not that kind of effort, and then just have it vanish, because it was very depressing. Yeah. Daunting, yeah. Um, I, I, when you talk about your writing, you talk a lot about going too far, and, and, and even when you present the work, you talk about, should I keep going? And so this is kind of um, ambivalent movement, which makes me think of the fragments and wonder if, so I have two questions. One is, are the fragments a way to continue within a work? And also, when you talk about the new novel, are the fragments larger? Is there, is, are, is there still a multitude of pieces, or is it a single narrative? I hope the narrative is more clear. I hope the structure is more clear. But I, I expected in these that the, that, that, that the narrative was going to just declare itself. That's all. It just, um, so I thought that'll, I mean, that's the part that just will appear. Meanwhile, I have to write these sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say it's fantastic to see you again. Well, it's lovely to see you again. <laughs> it's funny because I, I, since I come in Grand Central, I just walk by the center one day and I thought, wait a minute, I haven't been here before. Is this what's become of the Mercantile Library? And then I walked in and I joined. And then I haven't been here since. I don't know what. It's one of those things that drifted off, so I'm glad to be here again. Thank